Oh, there's a hush over the room. Isn't that lovely? A hush of anticipation. Am I on? Am I mic'd? Yes? Everyone can hear me? I can hear it. Hello. My name is Bronwyn Winter. I'm Professor Emerita of Transnational Studies at the University of Sydney. I am honoured to be chairing this forum today. And I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about the forum and why we think it's important. First, please turn your phones off, please. Or at very least, put you in silence. No photographing or videoing of people during this. We do have a photographer who will be going around taking photographs, the lovely Natalie. And we will be putting up a recording of the event on site in a couple of days. But please, no recordings or photography. I ask you to respect that. I'm visiting you here today from Marrickville, New South Wales, the very wet inundated heavily rained upon Marrickville. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a musical mm -hmm. isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. So Marrickville, maybe I should sing to you, is on the Wongal and Gadigal land. And I acknowledge today the Palawakani people from Utuwita land, Tasmania, and the Nipuluna land, Hobart, on which we meet. It always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We are but guests here. I pay my respects to the elders, both of the land where I live and the land on which we stand today, past, present and to come. I remain keenly aware that no apology will ever be enough and I do not expect forgiveness. It is a struggle we have to engage with on a daily basis. The struggle we're engaged today in this forum on gender identity in the law is of a quite different order. It has struggled to even be able to take place. First, it had to be postponed twice due to COVID related travel restrictions. Second, it faced cancellation attempts by Hobart City Councillor Jax Fox, sponsored by the Lord, supported by the Lord Mayor Anne Reynolds and Deputy Mayor Helen Burnett. So use your vote wisely next time. After a year-long campaign to derail this forum, the motion to refuse the use of the town hall to its organizers was defeated just last month by nine votes to three. And we owe a deep, gratitude, a deep, deep vote of gratitude um, to acknowledge the champion of women's rights by Alderman Jeff Briscoe and his strong support for this event taking place. The forum has been organized by the Coalition for Biological Reality, which was founded by Stasia Fry in September 2020 as a private Facebook group in re reaction to the growing need for a co coordinated response to gender identity laws infringing upon the human rights of other vulnerable groups, in particular women and children. The coalition has since grown into a nonpartisan, secular grassroots organization with just over 500 members and over 5,000 followers on its public Facebook page. This forum reflects the non-partisanship of the Coalition for Biological Reality. Over the last few days, much of the polarizing media reporting, including via social media and including out the front there, on Senator Chandler's Save Women's Sports Bill and on this forum, has tried to portray them as one camp in an opposition between the LNP and ALP Greens on the one hand, and between the anti-trans and pro-trans positions on the other hand. However, I can project more. It's my drama training. Sounds like we're good again. Neither of these fabricated operation or positions by the press reflects the truth. Both the Coalition for Biological Reality and the speakers on this podium today have a range of political allegiances and our arguments have nothing to do with depriving transgender people of oxygen. It is not with individuals, but with ideologies and practices that are detrimental to the rights and well-being of women, children, and indeed homosexuals of both sexes that we take issue. It is with the suppression of our freedoms of thought and conscience, both politically and as we see today legally, that we take issue. 
It is with the cult-like alliance between gender ideologues and certain sections of the medical profession to bully children, teachers, parents, lawmakers, and even medical practitioners themselves into submission that we take issue. It is with the Orwellian doublethink that denies the biological and social reality of sex and replaces it with an imagined construct of gender that curiously forces us back into oppressively narrow stereotypes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That we take issue. We take issue with its ideology and the practices it dictates and justifies, whether we vote for the right-wing parties or the left, whether we have a religious faith or not, whether we are young or old, whether we are male or female, and whether we are gay, bi or straight. We come together today to defend all women's fundamental rights to fairness, equality, and indeed safety, the rights of all children, to grow up without ideological or medical interference in their welfare, the rights of parents to know what is being told or done to their children and to carry out their responsibilities of protection and nurturing of those children to the best of their ability and the rights of all to, organize, to exercise their freedoms of speech and conscience without fear of victimization, penalty, loss of employment, it has happened, or worse, prosecution, which has also happened, outside situations of incitement to violence, obviously the exercise of free speech. And as far as situations of incitement to violence goes, it is in fact we gender critical people who are facing threats and bullying of the most shockingly violent kind. We face it in the streets, on social media, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our prisons, in our sporting facilities, in our political parties and trade unions, and even sadly from law enforcement on occasion as was recently the case of Jennifer Swain's encounter with the police in Wales. And it happens here too. We are in short facing the worst excesses of cancel culture, which has intimidated many into not speaking out or forced them into doing so under cover of anonymity. And some of the thank yous will be to people who are under that cover at the end of this forum. It has also sent women-only events underground, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a participant in some of those events, for fear of legal action or violence or both, and resulted in no platforming of a number of groups and individuals. Here in Hobart, for example, Women Speak Tasmania were no platformed at a Human Rights Week event due to an email sent out by former Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commissioner Robin Banks, and I had a planned public forum cancelled by the venue in 2019 during the debate over the Tasmanian sex self IDs laws, the first of their kind to be passed in Australia. I see there are some people just arriving. There are a few chairs in here. Please feel free to just mingle. Those laws in Tasmania were fast tracked through parliament without any community consultation or proper parliamentary debate. An alternative bill was developed by Women Speak Tasmania in collaboration with independent MLC Ivan Dean, but he was prevented from outlining this alternative bill in the Legislative Council, and Women Speak Tasmania's proposals received no media coverage. Yet, the alternative bill proposed a framework where the rights of all would be respected, essentially a gender recognition certificate that would acknowledge the desire of some to perform their gender in, in the ways with which they felt individually comfortable, but have no impact on sex-based rights. And I've lost my place, here we are. As a result of the lack of this parliamentary debate and censorship of public debate, many Tasmanians and indeed Australians remain completely unaware of the impact of self-ID laws, on girls and women in particular. Yet a radio poll undertaken in Tasmania before the self-ID debate found that 90% were in, not in support of individuals changing their legal sex on birth certificates. In fact, Australian and international polling consistently shows that the views held by the Coalition for Biological Reality and by the speakers on this forum reflect the views held by the majority of the voting population. Most do not want mixed sex public facilities, such as toilets and change rooms. Most do not support males competing in women's sport. The coalition has thus decided to put on this event in the hope 
of educating more Australians on the legal implications of gender ID legislation and so-called anti-conversion therapy legislation, which we will be speaking about and particularly Patrick Parkinson will be speaking about later, and of the concomitant institutionalization of gender ideology in various areas of public life for the rights, health and safety of women and children. Now we have six speakers today, starting off with our keynote speaker, Claire Chandler, who I'll introduce in a moment. On your program, Patrick Parkinson is listed as speaking before Holly Lawford Smith. In fact, it's the other way around. Patrick will, will Holly will speak after Exulansik and Patrick will speak after Holly. All the people speaking today have expertise on various aspects of the issue. Three of the speakers will be coming in by Zoom for you know, all sorts of obvious reasons. One of them actually lives in California. And I'm really honored to be chairing a forum, bringing together such a range of expertise and talent and commitment to discussion on this issue. It is now my great pleasure, my great honor, to introduce our first and keynote speaker, Senator Claire Chandler, whose courage and perseverance I greatly respect, notwithstanding our political differences in many other areas. In her as yet short career, which we hope will be a long one, Senator Chandler has stood out as a champion for women's rights. Liberal Senator for Tasmania, Chair of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee and Deputy Whip for the Liberal Party, she is the first Tasmanian Liberal woman ever to be elected to the Senate under the age of 30. Since her election, she has written and spoken extensively about the need to protect women's sex-based rights services and sports. And you may remember she was hauled before the Anti-Discrimination Commission in your state for doing so. Claire is chair, co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Women for Election Australia, formed by female MPs and senators from across the political spectrum to address the underrepresentation of women in parliament. As of January this year, according to the Interparliamentary Union, Australia ranked 57th in the world behind countries like Rwanda, Korea, for women's parliamentary representation, with performance being particularly poor in the lower house. Even before being elected, Senator Chandler actively advocated for women's representation. In 2017, she led a review of female engagement in the Tasmanian Liberal Party, which resulted in a significant increase in the party's female representation in parliament. She today, Senator Chandler will be speaking to us about women's sex-based rights, which are non-negotiable. She'll speak about the fight back by Australian women against the creation, erosion, my mistake, of women's sex-based rights and attempts by institutions, governments and media to denigrate, diminish and silence us. A round of applause for Claire. Uh, thank you all very much for the um, incredibly warm welcome and for uh, tolerating the uh, technical difficulties. And um, I do just want to address one thing before um, I start my presentation today. And Bronwyn mentioned the political differences between herself and me. Um, and certainly I suspect there are some real political differences between myself and many of the people in the audience today. Um, and yes, in the last week, uh, some of the issues that we're going to talk about this afternoon have become incredibly um, politicised. Uh, and I think that that does a disservice to just how widespread these concerns are. Um, from the very first day that I started talking about these things called women's sex-based rights, I was contacted by people from across the political spectrum, not just uh, people who have traditionally voted Liberal, but indeed ones who have said that they have always voted for Labor and the Greens and potentially always will vote for Labor and the Greens, but they have been um, concerned that there haven't been any voices uh, until mine in our national discourse discussing these issues. So it certainly does uh, go far and beyond any political barriers. Uh, and I thank all of you in the audience today that may not uh, always identify yourselves as um, voting for the same party that I'm a member of, but um, I certainly appreciate your support in being here and the support of all of the wonderful speakers you'll be hearing from uh, later on this afternoon. But it is a pleasure to be here in a venue that they tried to stop us from hiring, asking the questions that they tried to stop us from asking. And who do I mean when I say us? Well, I mean women 
and females. Well, women, comma, females. Um, what questions are we asking? Are they awful, horrific questions that no reasonable person should be uttering? Or are they simple, basic questions about women's sex-based rights, services and protections that previous generations have fought for? Judge for yourself. Listen to the conversations today. Form your own opinions. But here's a question that I've been asking. Do Australian women and girls have the right to play single-sex sport? Here's another question. Do you believe that a service providing support to women who are victims of male violence or sexual assault should be forced by law to admit males identifying as women? And yet another question. Do you believe a male criminal should be housed in a women's prison? For the last year, the Victorian Women's Guild has been asking Victorian members of parliament the Stanilan question, which is, do you believe that male sexed people have the right to undress and shower in a communal changing room with teenage girls? Let me remind you that child sexual abuse and sexual violence against women is at epidemic proportions in this country. And let me also remind you that there is no one single stereotypical and easily identifiable sex offender. But there is a long, long, long list of convicted sex offenders who got away with their crimes for a long time because nobody who knew them ever thought that they would be a risk to their victims. And there are two common themes when it comes to sex offenders. 97% are male and all of them were people who had in some way or another access to their victims. And that's why single sex spaces for women and girls are so essential. A character reference that a particular male or a group of males isn't a risk of harm to women is fundamentally unreliable. Many of the worst sex offenders that have ever been caught had a list of people who in good faith trusted them to be around children. Despite all of this, when asked by their female constituents in the Women's Guild whether male sexed people have the right to undress and shower with teenage girls, only four out of 128 members of the Victorian Parliament said no. Have you ever heard of such mass cowardice? In an era where the sexual assault of women and girls is front and centre in public discussion, 97% of elected members in the Victorian Parliament are not willing to say that males shouldn't have the right to use the women's change rooms that your teenage daughters are using. And we must also remember the people who tried to cancel this forum and the man who reported me to the Anti-Discrimination Commission in 2020 for saying that women's sports, change rooms and facilities were designed for females and should remain that way, don't want any of these questions about women's single sex spaces being asked. They don't want to acknowledge that by taking away the right to have single sex spaces by allowing self-identification, you are undermining a safeguarding practice the removal of which dangerous males can and will use to their advantage. We've already seen it happen in women's prisons all over the world where male sex offenders have identified as women so that they can be housed with vulnerable women. And we know that women have been sexually assaulted in prisons around the world because of this. Putting male criminals in a women's prison is so clearly dangerous and wrong. Yet how did we end up in a situation where any discussion of this issue is shut down by activists claiming that it's an attack on trans rights to question these policies? If your automatic response to women asking for privacy and safety and single sex facilities into insist that it's all a conspiracy against you, I think you need to take a step back and realize that you are putting your own feelings above 50% of the population. If you're male, regardless of how you might identify yourself, single sex women's spaces aren't a personal attack on you or your intentions. And if people are telling you that they are, then that's fundamentally false. Female only facilities are simply spaces which don't allow entry to the sex which perpetrates 97% of sexual assaults because that's a very real and obvious way to reduce the risk of assaults occurring in those spaces and to provide a sense of security and safety for women who may already have been victims of male violence and harassment. I do wanna make one thing absolutely clear. 
my point is not that trans people are dangerous. I'm suggesting no such thing. The vast majority of trans people, just like the vast majority of the rest of the population, are decent law-abiding people. But my point is that when you disconnect law and policy from reality, in this case, the reality of biological sex, then you are undermining sensible and necessary protections and creating loopholes that dangerous people can and will take advantage of. By refusing to acknowledge the legitimate and necessary reasons for women's single sex faces, by lobbying politicians and decision makers and asking them to deny women and girls the right to single sex faces, and by convincing the media that the women fighting for sex based rights should be ignored and even denigrated, activists are demonstrating a contempt for women's rights. They are saying that people of the female sex do not have the right to set our own boundaries. They're saying that women and girls, instead of prioritising their own safety and privacy and dignity, must prioritise the feelings of males and make concessions of our rights to accommodate them. The concept that women must open up our spaces to males is wildly incompatible with the message that we're trying to teach young girls today, that you're entitled to be safe, whether you're at home or in public, that you should speak up if you ever feel unsafe, and that you don't ever need to let someone emotionally manipulate you into putting their feelings above your own welfare. How can we, as a society, have people on one hand advising us to always let someone know where you're going and how long you're going to be when you go out for a job because there are dangerous men out there who might rape and murder you, but on the other hand say that if you see a male person entering a woman's toilet after a young girl, then you can't say anything because it's bigoted to assume someone's gender. How can we stay silent when we're constantly told to believe women and respect women, yet if we ask for single-sex spaces, then we're the ones who are bombarded with violent threats and abuse? Why should we fail to call out the hypocrisy of a movement, movement which claims that asking for sex-based rights for women is harmful and then tells the women who are asking for sex-based rights that we should go and kill ourselves. And I'm not exaggerating here, this has happened. Over the last two years, I have heard the most horrific stories of women um, who've contacted me and, and shared those stories, being bullied by their employers, their sports governing bodies, their professional associations, simply for asserting their own sex-based rights and using accurate sex-based language when talking about women's rights. I've seen the death threats. I've seen the rape threats, the threats to ruin their lives and to have them fired from their jobs and made unemployable. And I've seen the media, the public service, parliaments and politicians turn a blind eye. I've sat in our national parliament and had the office for women tell me that any man who says he's a woman is a woman, which therefore must include a man who beat his fiance to death and has killed three times. I've seen the Department of Health devote resources during the worst outbreak of the COVID pandemic to stripping the word woman out of a vaccination guide for pregnant women. These are real events happening to Australian women, events that I'm constantly told by left-wing journalists and politicians that I should be ignoring. But we're not going to ignore these issues and we're not going to ignore the hypocrisy. We're not going to accept that it's a human right to enter a single-sex space or a single-sex sport specifically designed for the protection of the opposite sex. And that's why this forum's important. People haven't heard our views and they haven't listened to our concerns about the erosion of sex-based rights and accurate sex def definitions in law and in policy. Instead, they've been fed a bunch of lies and emotional blackmail and smears. A forum like this gives Tasmanians and those from interstate who have traveled to be here, the chance to hear our views about why sex matters. You might hear someone say something today that you disagree with. Um, from one of our speakers, and I might too. That's what freedom of speech looks like in our democracy, and that is a good thing. 
But if you disagree that women are entitled to single sex spaces and sports and services, I say to you, make that case on its merits. Spell out your position clearly about why women and girls don't need or deserve sex-based rights. Find an argument that doesn't rely on calling us TERFs or reporting us for hate speech or lobbying the local media to call us bigots. We've heard so many times in the last couple of years that we must listen to women, that we must believe women. Well, today, here is your chance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Claire. I was just telling the media a little while ago that as somebody who is on the left of politics, I currently feel politically homeless over this issue, and I feel betrayed by the parties for which I have voted all my life. We now shift with our next speaker, who's actually Zooming in today, Professor Diana Kenny, a dear colleague of mine from the University of Sydney. We're both retired, but um, that is where we both worked, and we were both also actively involved, actively involved in our union there. Diana is a psychologist. She is a fellow of the Australian Psychological Society and was an academic at the University of Sydney for 31 years. So we're sort of pretty much contemporary on that level. She ended her tenure there as professor of psychology. In her long career, she has authored 10 books and over 250 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, invited submissions to government and commissioned reports. She's now in private practice. She's a specialist developmental psychological and developmental psychopathologist, psychologist and psychopathologist, oh, they're long syllables, those words, whose primary focus has been in promoting the mental health, education and welfare of children in young people. She has also has a focus on family therapy and has treated a number of cases of gender dysphoric children and their families. She is a member of the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine and GenSpect, an international alliance of parent and professional groups whose aim is to advocate for parents of gender questioning children and young people. Diana is going to speak to us today about rapid onset gender dysphoria, social contagion and faulty science, the making of a psychic academic. And I'll just give you a short overview. She considers the phenomenon of rapid onset gender dysphoria, a term coined by Lisa Littman in the United States, as yet another psychic epidemic fueled by the mechanisms of social contagion, accompanied by fundamental changes to language and concepts around sex and gender, legislative changes, flawed educational curricula, and we're seeing that now for kindergarten. I don't know if anybody's seen the latest news on that one, but we can, I can fill you in later on if you like. Automatic affirmation of young people from teachers, therapists, and doctors, exclusion of parents, and vilification of anyone who dares to challenge the prevailing ideology. So is Diana with us on Zoom? Are you there, Diana? Yes, yes she's here. We're used to these awkward pauses in academia. This happens to us all the time. People's Zoom connections fall out, particularly in times of COVID. We had casual teachers who didn't have internet at home trying to teach on mobile phones because they weren't given resources by their employers. Universities didn't get job seeker and job keeper and university managements were appalling to their staff throughout the country, appalling to their staff. We had overwork, we underpaid, casuals lost their jobs, they were working from home in these terrible conditions. So I'm very, very familiar with the problems of technology as we had to rapidly shift everything online. Could the host please allow my screen to be shared? We're getting there. I could tap dance for your scene, but I sing very badly. I dance a bit better. 
But yeah, we've, we had a tough time in, in educational institutions during COVID. I'm sure a lot of you know about it personally, or I've heard about it from friends and acquaintances. There she is. Welcome, Diana, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, could you please allow my screen to be shared? Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak today on rapid onset gender dysphoria, faulty science and social contagion. There are four competing but not mutually exclusive conceptual models regarding gender dysphoria. The first is that it's a physical illness that must be treated medically and or surgically. The second is that it's a sexual minority with rights of recognition. The third, that it constitutes a developmental psychopathology. And the fourth is that it's a psychic epidemic caused by social contagion. What is social contagion? Simply, it's a harmful idea or practice spread by close contacts in social networks. Social contagion is a social construction that predates the internet. It predated the advent of the cyber age, therefore placing the origins in the minds of humankind, relegating social media to its role as an efficient conduit of social contagion. In 1774, Goethe wrote The Sorrows of Young Verva which launched a suicide cluster of young people who had been disappointed in love. In 1984, a suicide of a young Austrian businessman who threw himself in front of a train initiated a spate of similar suicides. When Goethe's book was removed from the public and media exposure of the train suicide was stopped, the suicide rate dropped by 80% almost immediately in both cases. More recently, we've noted the Werther effect in celebrity suicides from a very large study um, coming out of South Korea published just late last year. In this study, the authors tracked the suicide rate across the population 10 days before a celebrity suicide. And then they tracked the suicide rate 10 days after the suicide. And you can see from the dark blue line that there was a very sharp increase in suicides immediately following the celebrity suicide. When we um, divide the population by age groups, and you can see the four age groups there, you will notice that the ages of 10 to 29 had the sharpest increases in suicide following the celebrity suicide rate. And there was a very small, but almost no change in the suicide rate for older people. Similarly, if we partition the population by male and female, you will again see that females were much more likely to engage in copycat suicides immediately after the celebrity suicide compared with males. This is exactly the same pattern of social contagion that we are witnessing in gender dysphoria. That is young females aged 10 to 29 are most susceptible to the message of gender ideo ideology. We have to ask ourselves, is this a coincidence? So change in reporting and social media exposure following the celebrity suicides resulted in a significant decrease in copycat suicides, just as it had done in 1774 and 1984. So who is most affected apart from young women aged 10 to 29? Well, within this subgroup, the most vulnerable adolescent females are most affected. Many have multiple mental health diagnoses including autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, ADD, social anxiety disorder, 
depression, including major depressive disorder, identity confusion, family issues, confusion regarding their sexual orientation, including internalised homophobia, and fear that they will never be attractive to men. Social contagion begins with the distortion of reality. It is followed by a cult-like adherence to the faulty precepts that tolerates no rational challenges to their veracity. A few years ago, there was a very compelling series called 13 Reasons Why, um, in which there were 13 episodes outlining the suicide of a young adolescent female from a range of different perspectives. The National Association of School Psychologists published a statement that included the following. We do not recommend that vulnerable youth, especially those who have any degree of suicidal ideation, watch this series. Its powerful storytelling may lead impressionable viewers to romanticize the choices made by the characters and or to develop revenge fantasies. This statement could well apply to those who've been seduced by gender ideology. Similarly, um, the, the, the epidemic of anorexia nervosa follows a similar pattern. Mostly young adolescent and young adult females are affected in which the thin represents the body ideal. Anorexia is not just about striving for an idealised body image. It's an obsessive, relentless and futile quest to be pure, perfect and clean. So what are some of the conceptual distortions in transgender ideology? <clears throat> the first is that gender identity is fixed and immutable during childhood. The second is that sex is somehow assigned at birth. That is that the nine months of gestation and the genetic material contained in ova and sperm have nothing to do with the sex that uh, appears before people when a child is born. Another um, distortion is that gender is a personal choice and that you can change your natal sex to match your perceived gender through hormones and surgery. Regret and detransition mean that gender identity is not fixed and immutable during childhood and therefore have to be denied. And there's no doubt about it. If you look at the postings of the gender lobby, gender ideology lobby on the internet, they vehemently deny that regret is anything more than less than a fraction of 1% and there are hardly any detransitioners. Well, we know for certain that that's absolutely untrue. Gender reassignment surgeons are reporting increases in requests for reversal surgeries. We're seeing young females who went onto the GoFundMe site to fund their mastectomies now going back on the sites to fund their breast reconstructions. I do recommend everybody watch the BBC documentary, One Life, Make Me a Man Again, which was published as, as long ago as 2004. Also have a look at the website, Sex Change Regret, run by Walt Heyer that has 25,000 visits a month. There's also the Detransition Advocacy Network, where hormones and surgery may alter appearances, but nothing changes the immutable fact of your sex. Longer term regret in adulthood has not been systematically studied and studies are urgently needed. There is no regret or detransition, really. There are now tens of thousands of young people suffering from their decision to detransition. To, sorry, to transition. The concept of social contagion is anathema to each of these distortions in transgender ideology. Another um, uh, documentary that I would strongly recommend is this wonderful account of a young detransitioner, which unfortunately I don't have time to show you today, 
but I've provided the link for those interested later. Oh, sorry. So where's the evidence for gender ideology? The evidence regarding psychosocial and cognitive impacts are generally lacking. It's a momentous step in the dark to prescribe cross-sex hormones and mutilating surgery to young people whose bodies are not fully developed. It's an unregulated live experiment on children. Giving children the right to independently make life-changing decisions at an age when they cannot be expected to understand the consequences of those decisions lacks scientific evidence and is contrary to established medical practice. Project Natty, Netty, which I recommend to those interested in doing their own study on the problems with gender ideology state, it is wholly ideological, scientifically inaccurate and socially irresponsible to recast biological sex as a social construct, which then becomes a matter of chosen individual identity. So one of the biggest denials in transgender ideology is the denial of the phenomenon of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Prevalence estimates of gender dysphoria before the onset of ROGD indicated male to female cases outnumbered female to male cases with one per 10,000 males and one per 27,000 females. These rates qualify for or orphan designation status defined by the European Union as less than five in 10,000 of the general population. Now we're seeing an incredibly rapid increase in young people declaring them transgender, and we're seeing a reversal of the ratios between boys and girls. Um, this graph shows the annual referrals um, starting from 2009-10 to 2016-17, and you can see that as of about 2014, the extremely rapid increase in girls declaring themselves transgender compared with boys. In the UK, in the Gender Identity Disorder Clinic, numbers rose from 200 to 2,000, a tenfold increase in five years. And they too observed a very strong reversal of male-female ratios. The DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, estimated that natal adult males who are transgender constitute about 0.005% of the population and natal adult females 0.002% of the adult population. If we have a look at the adolescent transgender estimates, of 0.7% of 13 to 17 year olds living in the USA identifying as transgender. This estimate is between 140 for males and 350 for females times higher than that for adult males and females. These figures cannot be explained by anything other than social contagion phenomenon. I've compiled figures in Australia that support international figures that I've just quoted. And uh, I've mainly focused on America and the UK, but the same figures um, have been identified in Scandinavia, Finland, Sweden, and in other countries in Europe. You can see from the same time frame, 2014 to 2019, the extremely rapid rise in young people presenting to gender clinics throughout Australia in the states that had gender clinics um, up to 2019, which were New South Wales, Western Australia, Queensland and Victoria. The percentage of children seeking treatment for gender dysphoria and the proportion of children from the general population aged 15 to 19 in these four states show that there's a disproportion between the states. 
So New South Wales is underrepresented in the number of children seeking treatment. Western Australia and Victoria are grossly overrepresented. And these are hubs of social contagion. We all know about the um, Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, which um, is a super spreader of uh, uh, gender dysphoria and uh, transition among young people. And you can see the disproportionate representation in Victoria of young people seeking treatment at uh, gender clinics. So again, strong evidence of social contagion and um, social networks and hubs within those social networks that are supporting um, the spread of these harmful ideas. So Western Australia accounts for 14% of children aged five to 19 in the Australian population, but accounts for 23% of young people enrolled in gender disorder clinics. Victoria accounts for 32% of children aged five to 19 in the Australian population, but accounts for 41% of young people enrolled in gender clinics. This is evidence of clustering, a major phenomenon seen in other social contagions throughout history. So in, um, if we look at gender development in adolescence, we find longitudinally that most gender non-conforming children will later identify as a sexual minority. Um, the majority of them, if they're allowed to develop normally along their normal um, trajectory, 80% of cross-gender behaving boys eventually become gay men and um, are able to accept their sexual orientation. The other possibilities are that they become gender queer youth, some become heterosexual youth, and an extremely small minority will remain transgender. So social contagion does not just affect young adolescent females. If we have a look at what's happening in society, um, we see that people and organisations and institutions that are supposed to protect young people from harmful ideas and practices are in fact suborning those practices. These are the government appointed gatekeepers of child safety who ought to be questioning and scrutinising the affirmation only approach to transition for children. Instead, they are endorsing it and shame on the Australian Human Rights Commission, the eSafety Commission, the State Commissioners for Children and Young People, um, people like Michelle Telfer receiving hagiographic interviews and um, Australian stories and so on, the Family Court of Australia, the ABC, all of these places, um, uh, who are supposed to protect children are in fact doing the opposite. So parents beware and the community beware, uh, beware. Use your own judgment and knowledge of your child before deciding on the gender transition pathway. If in doubt, wait, watch and wonder and consider the toxic role of social contagion in your child's current struggles with their gender identity. Thank you. One. Not sure I'm mic'd yet, so I'll just project. Can you hear me? Excellent. We're actually going to segue a little bit from um, Diana's uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. I've long been a fan of Diana's work. She's done, she's been working on this issue for a very long time. Our next speaker is coming to us all the way from California. 
uh, not physically, but um, virtually, and her time is around 6.30 yesterday evening, I believe. So um, don't you just love space time? Her name is Exu Danzig. I hope I have pronounced that correctly. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her, and her, her, she's a very interesting segue from Diana, because Exu Danzig is going to talk to you um, in part about detransitioning, about the experience of transitioning and detransitioning and desisting. Um, from transitioning and um, how that is affecting women and lesbians. To, to tell you a little bit more about her, she has a bachelor's degree in gender and women's studies and linguistics from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a master's degree in education specializing in speech pathology. She is licensed and certified to practice in that specialization in California and provides clinical services to a diverse population in an outpatient setting. She experienced gender dysphoria and identified as transgender one in college before seeking therapy, which led to the recovery from gender dysphoria and acquisition of coping skills that, as she puts it, were more supportive than a breast binder and less harmful than surgery. So more of a desister than a detransitioner, so good for her and good for the people who actually came across her path and helped her. One of her current clinical interests is in the pathophysiology of transmasculine and transfeminine voice disorder and why some transitioning people do not develop a vocal pathology from her hormones while other people do. Exodanzi, she has a very, very active social media presence. She is on Instagram, TikTok, Getter, and her largest following is on YouTube. <laughs> she got banned from YouTube. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh. I just got the latest notes I was given. So, well, thank you very much for that update. This is happening to a lot of us all the time. I sort of, you know, I, I tend to stay away from most social media because I find Twitter extremely poisonous. And so I sort of tend to limit myself to Facebook. But I know a lot of people are getting banned um, just for speaking the truth, really. Um, so, excellent. just to give you a very, very brief overview of her talk. I have a much longer abstract, but she can talk about that herself. She's going to present her analysis of transgender ideology as a modern religion with established faith positions, practices and organizational structures in place, and a close collaboration with the medical industry. Failure to resist this religion, she argues, will leave us headed for a future where policy is dictated by dogma and power relations. Mm, sounds like a work of fiction that was very, very famous. Who wrote it? Somebody called Orwell? Uh, rather than science and justice. And the most vulnerable in the, among us, we know very well, will pay the heaviest price. So I'm hoping we've got her on Zoom. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think just leave the PowerPoint aside. Sorry about that, but we're having too many technical difficulties. Just talk to us. Okay, sure. All right, I can still use it for myself. Uh, so, so my presentation was called the my uh, and and you. I'm assuming you can hear me. Let me know if you can't. Uh, the trans rights are not human rights. Uh, so, so uh, arts rights here is spelled R I T E S. They are religious rituals uh, that are undertaken uh, for a specific purpose, and I'm going to be talking about the different uh, purposes that the different branches of the trans religion um, are aiming at. Uh, and this is based on about a year of, of work where I have been looking at their, their literature. I have looked at their personal narratives, uh, uh, trying to piece together using skills that I learned in linguistics, trying to, to decipher the rule governed system that is generating these belief statements. And so in doing so, I've, I've come up with uh, what I consider to be the main three branches and the main doctrinal splits between the, two, the, the different branches. Uh, and so as mentioned, I was recently canceled from Patreon and YouTube, uh, and more distantly from Twitter and from TikTok for, for saying these heresies. Uh, if you want to see my videos, they are on exalandic.com. Uh, and so I was asked to speak here as a detransitioner. Uh, and and uh, so there, there is a split between detransitioner and desister. Uh, I'm kind of on the borderline there. Uh, uh, I did undergo a medical treatment that did change my biology. Uh, and it wasn't aimed at the purpose of achieving that conference, and it was while I was in the trans church, and it was because of exposure to that ideology. So I personally consider myself a detransitioner. Um, however, it was not testosterone, it was not surgery, and it was not visible. So 
it's a uh, uh, depends on what exactly you want to say the split is there. I'm definitely borderline though. Uh, I certainly took it seriously enough to go to the doctor. And uh, in in terms of uh, um, okay, whereas a desister is typically defined as somebody who underwent some sort of social transition, uh, which would be um, uh, changing now nowadays changing your pronouns uh, or or uh, changing your uh, clothes. Uh, or otherwise coming out in some way. Um, and so when you are entering the church, this distinction is not that relevant. They don't, they don't really see you as leveling up in the same way. You, you're, you're just as valid and, and they'll give you all sorts of reasons why it's okay to not take this or that medical step. You might, maybe you can't afford it. Maybe it's, it's you have some other condition, this or that. Um, but when, once you leave, it becomes very important. It becomes a, a measure of your, your faith to determine whether you were, you were really um, a member or not because it's a religion and religions don't like apostates. So when, when Christians leave Christianity, they're often told that, um, you know, they never really accepted Jesus because if you really accept Jesus, then you don't leave. Okay. So um, in terms of, of my timeline, uh, I, I felt uh, what, what I, I believe would now be termed gender dysphoria when I was very young and had a, a lot of difficulty with, with the fact that I was female and that other people could see that and that they, they had expectations surrounding that related to me. Uh, I had a lot of very specific and odd fears um, uh, related to that. And it, and it was just, it was, a, it was an issue that a lot of people didn't really understand because uh, it wasn't coming from the environment. It was, it was coming from, from, from me and some issue I had. And, uh, but that wasn't really resolved, uh, perhaps because my brain wasn't developed and it couldn't resolve earlier than it did. Um, but one way or the other, by the time I got to college, I was uh, then exposed to a lot of uh, the, the current gender beliefs um, when, when they were becoming popular. And this would have been uh, the main exposure I got was in 2009. And I was at Berkeley. Berkeley is where Judith Butler teaches. Uh, so I had a lot of exposure to her ideas. I was a gender studies major. Uh, her uh, ideas were very influential in the gender studies department, although it's worth noting she does not teach in that department, or at least did not when I was there. I believe she still does not. She's in the rhetoric department. She's also not a linguist, even though her, her argument famously relies on comparison with a concept that comes from linguistics, uh, which she, she, she extends a bit further than I believe she should. Uh, so her, her idea is that gender is a performance. And so it's like a linguistic performance. Um, in linguistics, the idea of a performance is, is the verb uh, pronouncing. If I say, I now pronounce you man and wife, the only way to do that verb is to say, I pronounce you man and wife. And so it is a performative verb. That's what, what it means. You, you do it by saying it. Uh, and so she tries to extend that to social behavior. I don't think that that really flies. And I wonder how much she has read about social pragmatic language. Um, but but in, in any event, I think that, that um, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't quite uh, make a lot of sense in retrospect because um, anybody can say any word. And the idea of gender is that some people more naturally say some words and I don't think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it also raises the question, you can lose your language. You can, you can have a head injury and lose language entirely. And so at that point, um, you would be the linguistic equivalent of somebody who, who is uh, agender, somebody who was without a gender. And so what does it mean to be agender? Because it's presented by these people as being a, a, not a severe handicap. But if gender is like language, then being agender would be a severe, severe handicap. You, you, we're talking about somebody that would need round-the-clock care, according to their idea of gender. So it's, it's just, it's not a very coherent model. It's not rooted in a deep understanding of language, yet they're making these comparisons. So, I was also going to talk a little bit in my next slide about uh, when I was still in college, uh, I, I had the support of a therapist who was not a gender therapist, uh, who was a neutral therapist. I also had the support um, of other, other, other sources of support. And so I was able to reason through a lot of things about um, risks, consequences, and, and outcomes and exercise good judgment in the choices that I made to not continue pursuing these. Uh, uh, close friend was not so lucky. Uh, she uh, her first exposure to therapy was uh, somebody who advertises a gender therapist that she thought out for gender therapy. And um, shortly after she began gender therapy, she was actually uh, sustained a very significant head injury. 
And despite the head injury, she was allowed to go through the double mastectomy that she didn't need a couple months later. And uh, as somebody in my, my, the field I'm in now, a big part of my work has been um, working with brain injury rehabilitation. And, and, and uh, it disturbs me more and more that everybody in her environment, every, every medical person connected to her knew that she had been in this injury, had this injury because it involved a hospital stay. It was a very significant injury. And she uh, was still allowed to, to go through with this uh, just a few months after starting this gender therapy too and without hormones. Uh, so when, when, when did it start to jump the shark for me? Uh, jump the shark is a, an expression that comes from happy days and, and it refers to when, when it started to, when I started to realize this wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Uh, as I mentioned, one was this complete failure of the gender industry to recognize that she was acutely unable to give consent to, to what was done to her. Uh, the second one is that uh, there was an abandonment of principles of scientific inquiry uh, that I saw gaining attraction. And one of this was that they'd started, uh, uh, this individual in particular and other people had started to speak out against the practice of sex segregation in medical research. And I, I recognize that as, as a feminist, as somebody that's familiar with the history of, of women in medicine to be uh, very dangerous. Uh, so, so at that point, I kind of realized that we were, were, were leaving the rational side of things and entering a world where we were trying to doctor medical data in order to comport with a, a pre-existing belief structure that, that, that wasn't rooted in, in any sort of definition of evidence. Um, as, uh, and then the other thing for me was, was seeing more and more of um, people who are identifying as trans men, which for me never exceeded the scope of my sex. I was always a kind of woman as a trans man. I was never a man. I was never asking people to call me he, him, or insisting I was male in some way. That wasn't something that, that fit into my theoretical framework of this, but it had started to become more, more and more popular for um, lesbians to call themselves gay men, and that just bothered me. I didn't like that. Um, so gender identity, I wanted to find this a little bit. Um, the reason that I would say that this is like a soul, uh, one is that the uh, gender identity, which is, is claimed to be at some sort of deep internal sense of knowing that is, that is a claim that it is only known to the devotee. It's only known to the adherent. Uh, you, uh, the individual is communing with this deity, this gender I deity, I call them, uh, and, and, and gaining special knowledge from the deity and gaining special blessings of the deity. And the blessings are increased if other people in the person's environment also pray to the deity. And we pray to the deity by acknowledging a belief in the deity and acting as if we care what the deity thinks about what's going on in the real world. And we do so by using the deity's pronouns and pretending that the deity's pronouns supersede the individual adherent, the, the devotee's adherent uh, scope. Um, and uh, so, so uh, they've, they've pulled some, some fast ones on us too with the definition. Uh, it is claimed that uh, gender and sex are, are, are distinct entities. Uh, however, which, which at the time made sense to me because it's like the, the idea for gender was supposed to be about protecting masculine women from discrimination for the fact that we defy gender norms. That's how I thought of it. And then it, it has turned into uh, protecting males from discrimination on the basis of sex. And that doesn't make any sense because if a male is being discriminated against in a female only space, he's not being discriminated against on the basis of his gender identity unless gender identity is the same as sex and gender identity is not the same as sex. The only way that a person can be discriminated against on the basis of their gender identity in a female only space is if they are female. That's the only way, that's their logical prerequisite. And yet we're, we're being told that discrimination on the basis of sex is the same as discrimination on the basis of gender identity and it's not, it's not. These are, these are female only spaces, not feminine only spaces. If they want to have feminine only spaces, they can certainly lobby for that. I'm not against that. I, I, you know, I support the aims of feminism, which is the term I've given to the rights movement for feminine people, feminism. But where it conflicts with feminism, I'm against it because I'm a feminist. And feminism is a rights movement for females, female humans, both girls and women. Um, so let's see. So I've also named these subsects. So the main sect, Probably, I would argue the oldest sect would be uh, trans classic. And, and the big division there is Our Lady of the Perpetual Hormone Replacement Therapy. And the, the, the main doctrinal split between this one and the other main doctrine, the Church of the Non-Binaries, is that in trans classic, in Our Lady of the Perpetual Hormone Replacement Therapy, 
there is a metabolic or neurological basis for transitioning. Some people have some sort of biological reason that they need to transition uh, if it gets that far, which is why I call it the Our Lady Perpetual Hormone of Subdivisions because there's, there's more undifferentiated trans classic that doesn't think about it too much, but also does not share the non-binary beliefs. So they would still fall under trans classic. But the one with the most articulated sect, the one that I was part of, is Our Lady of the Perpetual Hormone Replacement Therapy. And so they believe that there is a, 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 a biological need to transition for some people. Um, they also will uh, believe in two genders, believe that they're connected to the sex, the two sexes, and also believe that there is, um, the gender identity is, is, is an entity that forms by age three and is connected to one of the two sexes. Uh, the more recent iteration has been Church of the Non-Binaries. The big doctrine splits there, the schisms there is that this sect believes the medical transition is a means to achieve a sense of unity, a sense of congruence with your internal sense of gender. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with biology. You're not taking the testosterone because you're somehow actually a male in some way and need the testosterone. You're taking the testosterone because you wanna look male and that will achieve a sense of internal congruence and then you'll feel better. So that's, that's the split. They have a different set of beliefs about why we do this practice. And, and those, those beliefs are irreconcilable. Uh, the Church of the Non-Binaries also typically is, sees gender identities as being more independent of the individual uh, and less tied to the individual. So they move around. The, your, your gender can change in history class. Your gender changes from day to day. A person can even be without a gender. As I mentioned, you can be agender. Uh, and so um, you are, uh, uh, this, this is the one that's more likely to, to also argue that you don't necessarily need to have experienced this as a child. You know, this is the real driver of the of the rapid onset group, because this is the one where where you just kind of need to 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 let people know that this is possible, and let it go from there. There doesn't need to be the whole history there, uh, because because uh, you you can just get a gender identity or you can get in touch with it, um, but it's it's not connected to biology and it's not really connected to the material world in the same way, uh, and it can change. So so obviously kids need time to explore their gender. Is, is what we keep hearing. Why do they need time to explore it if it's already forms and it forms naturally? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Do I need time to explore my language as a teenager or do I already know what language I speak? Pretty sure I didn't know what language I speak. I still encourage exploring languages, of course, as a linguist. Uh, discipleship of the disaffected, the sect believes that they are very different from you and other non-binary people and they do not want you to make any sort of conclusions about them, what they might be like and what they might want in the future. And so they don't really have any firm beliefs. You could also think of them as undifferentiated non-binaries. Uh, Church of the Non-Binaries versus the Our Lady Perpetual Hormone Replacement Therapy beliefs. Uh, the non-binaries believe in an unlimited number of gender identities. They believe these identities move between different individuals on different days. Uh, they believe that these individuals can be agender without a gender identity. Uh, and that's in contrast to Our Lady the Perpetual Hormone Replacement Therapy that believes in two identities. Believe that these identities form very early. Believe these identities are connected to man and woman and those are, are uh, somehow connected to male and female. And this is the sect that will believe that there's some sort of neurological mapping problem, that the brain has somehow expects there to be different genitals, and that's the reason. Uh, and so they, of course, believe, therefore, that everybody has a gender identity. To my knowledge, um, I do like to ask them things like, what gender was Terry Chavo after the brain injury? They, they, they usually haven't thought about her because they tend to be kind of ableist and don't really think about people with unusual brains, in my experience. Uh, the sect, uh, so then, then, then there's also since then has emerged uh, a non-denominational church of trans and this sect is an attempt to merge church of non-binaries with trans classic uh, and our lady the perpetual hormone replacement therapy by ironing out the major doctrinal differences in the name of respecting each other's identities and pronouns and thereby you know solidifying their social cultural power. Uh, major beliefs that set them apart from other trans subdivisions include uh, pronouns don't equal gender which is, uh, was, was a shock to me to read on TikTok that, that that was now a stable belief that a lot of people have. So there's an emergence of this concept of mispronouning uh, as being distinct from misgendering. So you, you can use somebody's correct pronouns and still misgender them if they figure out that you thought of them as the wrong gender. And this would cover things such as um, uh, if, if you use a, a, a gendered like term, like if you refer to somebody who uses he, him as an actress, but their gender was male, but if their gender is female, but they use he, him, then it's not misgendering or mispronouncing. So it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, and so these are uh, both attempts to uh, make up for the fact that non-binary pronouns do not comport with the binary gender categories and model of uh, perpetual hormone replacement therapy. 
So, so in order to make up for that, they have rules about just how, how, do, how do we go cope with the fact that this is a non-denominational church. Uh, so in terms of gender identity and law, pronoun expectations are anti-disability rights. Pronouns are a learned neurological function. I'm a pronoun therapist. I've spent years rebuilding people's pronoun systems and ability to use pronouns for them to gain some function back, some. And I don't want them to be harassed at work over stuff that doesn't have anything to do with what they're there to do when, when they work so hard to, to be able to use pronouns at least some of the time and not correctly a lot of the time, not specific correctly anyway. They're correct in, enough to get the point across and that should be good enough. Uh, so pronouns are a learned neurological function and therefore an individual's capacity to use preferred pronouns can be affected by any disability that affects the ability to use language, attend, mean pay attention, speak, remember, or think. And that is a lot of disabilities. Uh, pronoun expectations are anti-civil rights. Accent and second language discrimination is a major mechanism of discrimination on the basis of national origin, race, and creed, which are protected classes of people. Uh, speech and cognition discrimination, meaning unreasonable discrimination that is unrelated to essential job functions, are a mechanism of discrimination against older employees who are more expensive to employers, um, meaning the, the older an employee is, the more likely it is that the employer will have motivation to fabricate a hostile work environment claim to justify firing an older employee for, on the basis of not being able to perform uh, these pronoun expectations, which are of course unverifiable, whether they were even performed correctly or not. It's not materially, objectively unverifiable. All they have to do is lie, literally all they have to do. Uh, unless it's recorded and a linguist helps them, but even then you can't prove that the pronoun was wrong because we're appealing to, to, to a personal knowingness. I can't measure your knowingness. As far as I know, your knowingness doesn't exist. Pronoun expectations are anti-religious liberty, uh, gender atheists, uh, and a gender atheist is a person who does not believe that you have a gender identity, have a civil right to not be compelled to profess belief in the invisible, unverifiable, unmeasurable, improbable entities that have not been demonstrated to have any sort of material existence, which would be gods, uh, which are said to have great power and wrath, should we not worship them? And that's what they're said to have, right? If you don't worship them, they will, they will harm the children, is the idea. Uh, any religion with a belief in the separateness of maleness and femaleness and any prohibition on bearing false witness has the right not to use pronouns, which are lies. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the human cost of transition. Uh, and my research has uncovered people who have had uh, uh, transitions that ended up costing uh, upwards of a million dollars where they spent months in the hospital due to, due to multiple blood clots. I've interviewed people who ha ended up with uh, recto, um, wouldn't even finish that phrase, but, but complications that left them uh, unable to uh, control their own uh, bowels. And uh, all these are extremely predictable and there is no end in sight for the complications. They're not better now. So, 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 so the medical industry is, is, is mutilating people who they know to be mentally ill and they often know to also be brain injured. And they're doing so making money hand over fist in an environment where anybody who says, what are you doing? Is shouted down, deplatformed and, and vilified. This is not a good situation. And uh, the human cost of it is, is, you know, it remains to be seen. And we have no idea. And so part of my work has also been documenting the I Am Jazz series on TLC, which has followed uh, one of these children. Uh, and and uh, the short, short version is he's not doing well. Uh, he was transitioned when he was 11, immediately started having suicidality, apparently, according to the mother now. And um, yeah, it's, uh, you can watch my work on, on, on my website. Uh, we have no idea the true scale of this. We have no idea um, the extent of it. All we know is that these individuals will be living with the long-term effects um, on their body and on their brain, because everything that's not developing in their body is also not developing in the brain. Uh, for the rest of their lives. We are living through an age of uh, sex lobotomy. And so one day you will be asked, did you stand up against sex lobotomy? What did you do when it was happening? And so I, I encourage you to think about what your answer is going to be. And finally, I want to end with the definition of uh, exolancic, because I get asked that a lot. 
It comes from Exalansis, which is from the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows by John Koenig. And it means the tendency to give up trying to talk about an experience because people are unable to relate to it, whether through envy, uh, pity, or simple foreignness, which allows it to drift away from the rest of your life story until the memory itself feels out of place, almost mythical, wandering restlessly in a fog, no longer even looking for a place to land. We have to keep talking about what's, what's happened to us. So it's, um, we have to keep speaking out and not let them silence us. It's, uh, we deserve a place to land. Thank you so much for hosting me tonight. Of an I actually. Our next speaker, um, Claire, oh, she blew me away. She's, I haven't seen her before. She just blew me away. She's so much fun. Um, our next speaker, and she's right about it being a cult. Our next speaker, Claire referred earlier to the sorts of prices people are paying in their workplaces, uh, among other places. Our next speaker knows all about that. Holly Lawford Smith has been very bravely speaking out, denouncing gender ideology in her university. And she has met with no platforming, uh, criticism by senior staff in her faculty and university. And she's really been given a very, very hard time. Even her union branch has, uh, and union of which I was a proud member for a very long time, and still I'm an associate member, even her union local branch uh, supported gender ideology and spoke out against Holly and supported no platforming her. She's been incredibly courageous in the face of that. She set up a website called No Conflict, they said, uh, which um, documents experiences on which individuals document or groups document their experience of threats or assaults or invasions of space and privacy by um, individuals or groups supporting transgender ideology. And that site is now run by the Lesbian, Gay and Bisexual Alliance. That is a group which was set up in the UK to counter the trans takeover of the gay movement. And there is a branch here in Australia as well. So Holly Norford Smith is an associate professor in political philosophy at the University of Melbourne. And she's very brave to hang around because you know she has been given a very tough time. She has taught courses and still teaches courses on the ethics of immigration, everyday morality, feminism, the metaphysics of ethics and free speech and hate speech which we suffer quite a lot of, as you know. Her research over the last four years has been on radical and gender critical feminism and big congratulations are due. Her next book, Gender Critical Feminism is coming out with Oxford University Press in May this year. That is a big deal. Okay, um, so my starting point for thinking about gender identity propaganda was reading two books. Um, first, Kaiser Eckes Ekman's book, Being and Being Bought, and second, Gail Dines' book, Pornland. Both do a great job of explaining the way that language has been used manipulatively to shape the way people understand and feel about social practices that are and have been harmful to women. These are all new applications of an old idea, 
So Mary Daly was writing uh, in Beyond God the Father in 1973 about patriarchal language and the way it perpetuated sex caste hierarchy and arguing that we needed to invent a new lexicon in order to achieve feminist aims. So while Ekman and Dines were concerned with the language used to talk about pornography and prostitution, I'm gonna be interested here in the language used to do gender identity activism. And in particular, I want to talk to you about the way that some the used gender Sorry, what do you want to do? <laughs> what is that? Identity. In particular, I want to talk to you about the way that some of the language used in gender identity activism has functioned as anti-feminist propaganda painting women who are reasonably concerned about a range of real conflicts of interest as instead being exclusionary, hateful, bigoted, anti-science, and worse. Nothing could be further from the truth, and I think if we're all more aware of what the language is doing, we'll be in a better position to challenge it and ultimately to refute it. So let me start with a general account of propaganda. So Cheryl Ross in her 2002 paper, Understanding Propaganda, noted that propaganda is, okay, uh, associated often with lies, appeals to emotion and psychological manipulation. She thought other theorists of propaganda at the time had been too focused on how propaganda bypasses reason by appealing to the emotions. So for example, here is the Institute for Propaganda Analysis from a 1938 pamphlet, which she quotes. I'm gonna do it dramatically because it's dramatic. <laughs> um, Our emotion is the stuff with which the propagandist works. Without it, they are helpless. With it, harnessing it to their purposes, they can make us glow with pride or burn with hatred. They can make us zealots on behalf of the program they espouse. What we mean is that the intelligent citizen does not want propagandists to utilize his emotions, even to the attainment of good ends without knowing what is going on. So on the Institute's view, the propagandist is the puppet master pulling at people's strings through the manipulation of their emotions. And this is wrong because people have a right not to be manipulated, to be instead told the truth so that they can make a rational decision about what political causes they want to support. Okay, but Ross thought that there was more to what is bad about propaganda than just lies and emotional manipulation. So first, she argued that the view got things wrong by suggesting that the propagandist uses emotion instead of reason, as though emotion and reason are entirely separate. Sometimes particular emotions are reasonable. So in her account, the focus is on uh, instead how the propagandist elicits inappropriate emotional responses. So the propagandist might lie that some state of affairs happened, and then people might have an emotional response to that that would have been appropriate had the thing actually happened. So then the thing is not the, the problem is not the emotions, the problem is the lie. Second, one can be manipulative with reason alone. So Ross quotes Bertrand Russell as writing that, and I quote, someone clever could frame a sufficiently clever argument in favor of any position. So a clever argument made up of entirely false claims might wrongly persuade someone. There's no emotion there at all, but there still seems to be propaganda. So Ross thinks it's located in the false claims because the argument can convince someone of something they would never have accepted had they known that some of the claims involved in it were untrue. And then thirdly, and finally, the propagandist is, not, is surely not always a liar. So the first reason for this is that the propagandists themselves might believe the false claims. So they might spread falsehoods, yet not with any intention to deceive or to manipulate others. And the second is that lying can be counterproductive to the cause. If the lies are discovered, this puts the propagandists' credibility in question. 
So what's a better, more expansive account of propaganda that doesn't have these problems? On Ross's account, what's of central importance is that there's some defect in the claims that are made by the propagandist. So they might make false claims, use bad arguments, deploy flawed concepts, or rely on unfair or unreasonable moral rules. So in Ross's view, in sum, propaganda is an epistemically, which means to do with our knowledge or our beliefs, an epistemically defective message used with the intention to persuade a socially significant group of people on behalf of a political institution, organization, or cause. And one example of propaganda that she gives in her paper uh, comes from a 1990 US Senate campaign in which an African-American candidate was running against the incumbent, a white candidate. The white candidate ran an ad showing a pair of white male hands, these are the actual hands from the actual ad, um, crumpling up a job rejection letter with the voiceover, you needed that job and you were the best qualified, but they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? The African American candidate was on the record as opposing racial quotas. The ad falsely claimed that he supported them and, then, and that the white candidate in contrast opposed them. The white candidate was re-elected and the ad was believed to be crucial to his success. Okay, now we're in a position to look uh, at where specifically anti-feminist propaganda shows up in gender identity activism. So let's start with a couple of dramatic examples where that will illustrate Ross's point about it not being emotions per se, but inappropriate emotional responses that are relevant to propaganda. So I wanted to start with the razor blades hidden under stickers claim. So as Joe Bartosz reported for Lesbian and Gay News last year, the Northern Irish LGBT charity Rainbow Project tweeted out this message. We have been made aware of transphobic stickers being put up around Belfast. Please take a pic and report this directly to ourselves. Try to remove them safely, but use a tool to do so, as we have been made aware of razor blades being placed behind them. The Lord Mayor of Belfast retweeted this, and as Bartosz puts it, outrage flared on social media. There has been no evidence provided of such razor blades in fact existing and a spokeswoman from a gender critical organization contacted the police to ask whether there had been any reports of razor blades under stickers which of course there had not. So if gender critical feminists had been going around putting razor blades under stickers of course it would be appropriate to have a strong emotional reaction to that causing people to get their fingers sliced open for trying to remove political messaging is repugnant. The idea that there are razor blades under gender critical stickers is false information disseminated by gender identity activists in order to elicit what would be an appropriate emotional response to correct information. So that emotional response, outrage against gender critical feminists helps to bring supporters to the gender identity activist side and to strengthen commitment from people who are already allied with that side. Okay, second dramatic example. Comparisons to genocide. Here's a little bit of an article um, from an article by a philosopher, Mark Lance, writing for Inside Higher Ed uh, in 2019. I'm gonna sort of skip ahead a bit so that the arrows are where I am. He, say, he writes, in 1702, the New England Puritan Cotton Mather, skip a bit, asserted that the heathen savages that Europeans had met here were probably put here by the devil, likely lacked souls, were more akin to beasts than humans, and absolutely must at least be converted, and if not removed, i.e. killed. Skip on a little bit more. At the dawn of the 18th century, as a mass influx of Europeans are launching one of the largest campaigns of ethnic cleansing 
and genocide in human history, these remarks are violence. They are an endorsement of genocide and played a very real role in facilitating it. Next paragraph. Recently, a small but highly visible group of scholars has taken to arguing against the growing acceptance of the gender self-identifications of trans people, insisting that trans women are really men, trans men are really women, trans lesbians are really heterosexual men, and so forth, and often explicitly presenting these arguments as support for legal efforts to restrict trans folks' access to public spaces. Lance doesn't come right out and say that gender critical views are genocidal. He slightly backs off that claim by saying, oops, by saying, I do not suggest that the current situation around turf philosophers is as grim as the genocide of Native Americans. Obviously, there are differences of quantity and some of content between what happened to Native Americans in the 1700s and what's occurring in academe today. Well, thanks, Mark. That's very generous. <laughs> the differences of quantity and content, of course, being that Matha was literally advocating for the killing of indigenous people if they couldn't be converted to Puritanism, while gender critical feminists are advocating for the maintenance of sex segregated spaces on the grounds that sex and gender identity are not the same thing. So again, this is a mobilizing of emotion. Oh, now we're gonna to go too far. Okay. Um, here, uh, so, uh, no, I think that's right, thank you. So this is a mobilizing of emotion. Here it's outrage, anger and disgust at racism, imperialism, and violence. These emotions, of course, are appropriate to genocide, but they're entirely inappropriate to gender critical feminism. So the analogy is propagandistic. This move also takes a slightly different form, um, which I find very interesting as a philosopher, um, in the accusation that in questioning gender identity, Gender critical feminists are denying a person's existence, which tends to slide into wanting slash wishing for there not to exist, which tends to slide into kind of like wanting a trans genocide. So this tweet was just the top result when I entered um, genocide plus trans into the Twitter search bar yesterday. And it's talking about a state government move in Texas to prevent the surgical transitioning of children. So this slide from a precautionary approach to identity claims, especially in children, to an accusation of genocide is underpinned by an incredibly implausible philosophical claim. It's something like the claim Okay, that says man gender identity. Um, it's something like the claim, my specific gender identity is so important to my sense of self that were I not to have it, then I would not be who I am. I, this self would cease to exist and some other self would exist instead. So if you cause me not to have this gender identity, then you cause me not to exist. That's the philosophical claim. Of course, the embodied person with most of the properties that they had before is still standing right in front of you and no violence has been done. So if you think about replacing some other aspects of identity instead of gender identity in this claim, like being a Christian or being a mother or being a child prodigy violinist, it sounds absolutely absurd. So of course, you <laughs> could have become an atheist, right? Instead of a Christian or decided not to have children instead of being a mother or taken up team sports instead of being a child prodigy violinist. So we can have an interesting philosophical discussion about selfhood and identity, but disagreeing with some claim that exists within that debate doesn't put you anywhere in the ballpark of genocide. Okay. You might agree with me uh, that some of these examples count as propaganda, 
but you might have the objection, well, this kind of manipulative disinformation, it's only put out by a few bad eggs. Uh, they're not, it's not central to the ideology of gender identity activism. There are bad eggs on both sides, you might think. They cancel each other out. So uh, let me move to an example that's closer to the heart of gender identity activist campaigning. Inclusion. <laughs> so there are so many examples that I could have given here because I think inclusion is possibly the key word of those pushing to have gender identity replace sex in law and policy. But because Senator Chandler is our keynote speaker, and because there was a protest outside targeting her bill, and because this article from Wednesday's Tasmanian Times talks about the bill and the protest and the event, I've chosen to use it as illustrative. So the headline, as you see, refers to Senator Chandler's trans exclusion bill. <laughs> Variants of the word inclusion appear five times in the text of the article and once in the image of the open letter, which is at the bottom of the article. We are told this week, Tasmanian women will unite in support of transgender inclusion in the article. And in the open letter at the bottom, we see we, the undersigned, believe our community is stronger when it is inclusive, equal, and values the contributions of all its members. This idea of inclusion has been used especially in the domain of sport. It invokes the idea of popular kids in the playground leaving the weird kid out of their games and then the protective teachers and parents coming along and urging the popular kids to be kind, to do the right thing, to make the weird kid feel included. Nothing very much is at stake. But as John Pike points out in this paper, in sport, inclusion is not the only and not even the most important value. There are also the values of safety and of fairness. Safety is particularly important in combat sports like rugby and football, and a lot is at stake. Injury to women players, places in elite sports for women players, for which there is a pipeline from amateur sports, and fair competition for women players at all levels. Pike notes in this paper that people tend to try to balance these different values out, but he argues that this is a bad approach. He says that authorities have basic duties that cannot be permissibly traded off. So he thinks that instead of balancing we should put these values in priority order. Safety first, then fair competition next, then inclusion last. But if we do this, activists' cries that keeping males out of women's sport is not inclusive become far from compelling. There's a little bit of emotional bludgeoning going on with the inclusion rhetoric, but I think the more interesting move is that it's highly misleading when it comes to the facts of the disagreement. In Ross's terms from earlier, we have an epistemically defective message and it's being used to persuade people to a political cause. It's simply not true that Senator Chandler's bill or gender critical feminism more generally is trans exclusionary. Rather, it has a disagreement with gender identity activists over the classification of trans people for particular purposes. Gender identity activists want people classified by their identities. Gender critical feminists want people classified by their sex, especially when it comes to things like sports and prisons where bodies matter a lot. Gender critical feminists include trans men and female non-binary people. Gender identity activists include anyone with a woman gender identity. No one on either side is excluding trans people per se. The final point I wanna make on inclusion is that women have been excluded historically from sports, from public life and from work. Part of the project of working on women's full inclusion involves taking special steps to encourage more women into areas where they have historically been excluded. Including men in those projects might jeopardize them, especially when doing so increases injury risk or creates unfairness. 
It is absolutely not the case that people who care about inclusion should want male trans athletes in women's sport and people who hate inclusion should want women's sports for women. Rather, people who care about inclusion should be thinking carefully about how women's inclusion in male-dominated areas of life might be negatively impacted by the push to include trans people in the opposite sex categories because of their gender identities. So inclusion, re inclusion rhetoric is propagandistic largely because it's so misleading. Okay, there are loads of other interesting examples that I don't have. Uh, Okay, sorry, that is late. Um, one more? Yeah. So there are heaps of other interesting examples that I won't have time to talk about here. Um, I just put some of them up for, for reference. Maybe I'll say quickly about the first, um, just to give an example. So there's the way that women fighting to maintain single sex, sex spaces tends to be portrayed as segregation, which means a dominant social group denying equal treatment or equal access to a marginalized group. And then this sets gender critical feminists up as the dominant or the oppressor. Whereas in reality, the fight for single sex spaces is separation, which means a marginalized social group withdrawing from the dominant group in order to create solidarity and support. And it is a feminist move. So on that reading, it is males slash men who are the dominant or the oppressor on the grounds of sex caste and women who are marginalized. So using the word segregation invokes a whole history of racial domination to position trans women in a particular way. Whereas using the word separation tells more of the truth about why feminists care about single sex spaces. So although there's a lot more to say on this topic of gender identity propaganda, I'm hoping that what I've said already is enough at least to make you think more about how gender identity activists are pursuing their goals, and in particular about the misinformation and emotional manipulation that is going on in the course of what is actually a pretty ordinary conflict of interest between political groups. Thank you. Oh yeah, we sure are in a propaganda war, but it's not one we ever declared, it was declared on us. And as many people know, the no platforming, the silencing and the space given to the propaganda in the media is distressing to say the least. It's hard to have a public debate when you can't even get a voice within that debate. Our fifth speaker, and we are having to go probably a little bit over time, and we can't help that. We did have extensive technical problems, as you witnessed, so we're just going to try and hurry along towards the end. We have two more speakers. Uh, I'm quite excited about our next speaker. I don't know personally, but he's uh, a very, very well-known expert in law, and particularly family law. And we're moving from language now to legislation, but also in talking about legislation, we're going to be talking about the language propaganda and the sort of double speak that we have been criticizing. Professor Patrick Parkinson is professor and former dean at the TC Burns School of Law at the University of Queensland. He's a specialist in family law, child protection, law and religion, and the law of equity and trusts. He has written extensively on family law in Australia, including child abuse and welfare and family law disputes. His important reference work, Australian Family Law in Context, went into its seventh edition in 2019. Professor Parkinson also, also served from 2004 to 2007 as chairperson of the Family Law Council an advisory body to the Federal Attorney General and chaired a review of the child support scheme in 2004 to 05, which led to the enactment of major changes to the child support scheme. From 2011 to 2014, he was president of the International Society of Family Law. In addition, he's done a lot. He is well known for his community work concerning child protection, including as a former member of the New South Wales Child Protection Council and chairperson of a major review 
of the New South Wales law concerning child protection, which led to the enactment of the Children and Young Persons Care and Protection Act of 1998. In recent years, there's been working very closely with psychologists, psychiatrists, and pediatricians on the issue of gender identity. And he's going to be talking to us today about something that's close to my own heart, these, um, um, uh, these anti-conversion therapy laws. What laws have already been passed, we've already got the sex self ID law here, but there's also these so-called anti-conversion therapy laws. You'll remember that conversion therapy used to be for homosexuals to use various shock techniques and other things to cure people of homosexuality. Now these anti-conversion therapy laws, so-called, are a form of double speak, where in fact their real purpose is conversion into a gender identity discourse and harmful treatments of children. And uh, Patrick is going to be talking to us at some length about the implications of these laws, among other things. So we hope he's with us on Zoom. Um, I hope I'm with you as well. Can, 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 every, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you yet. Uh, okay. Well, I think that's not my problem. My, my video is on, I promise. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at what's going on with the video. There you are. We got you. Oh, no, we lost you. Have you, have you got me? Got, have you got me now? We've got a picture of you. We haven't got you actually... Ah moving and saying things that is because i put on i turn my camera off now um okay you're not getting my camera up at, at, at all let me no, we're just getting a just getting a, a very nice photo of you with a red tie smiling thank you well that's at least a start if i shift to um my laptop camera can you see me now Unfortunately not, but we can hear you. Yeah, right. Maybe start talking to us and we'll press on. Yeah, okay. Well, it appears, I'm afraid, that there is a camera problem. Um, let's keep going. And if, um, if the team can bring up the camera, that would be great. So conversion therapy laws, um, there's been a kind of epidemic of them in the last few um, months, uh, last year or eight, 18 months in, in particular. And one of the questions I want to talk about is why? Um, the argument is that there's an issue about conversion therapy. But as Bromman said in her intro, in, introduction, the, the kinds of things we talk about as conversion therapy, av aversion to same to to same sex pictures, this kind of thing, they disappeared from psychiatry in the 1980s. Sometime there were some Christian groups, particularly in the United States. There was Exodus, which um, went on for a while with Christian forms of prayer therapy and so on. But by and large, the attempts to change somebody's sexual orientation. Um, have long since disappeared. There's an acceptance that um, there may be some um, development and change through adolescent years, but there comes a point at which somebody's sexual orientation can be quite fixed. But notwithstanding that, there's been this urgency to have conversion therapy laws. Um, we've seen them in Queensland, that, that was, was um, 2020, then the ACT, and then um, in 2021 in Victoria. And Victoria is the most extreme of the Australian laws. They could be sentenced to imprisonment for up to 10 years in certain circumstances. Now, let me emphasize the Victorian law, you'd have to, the prosecution would have to prove quite a lot before it could get that conviction. But there's also um, powers of administrative bodies to investigate professionals. It's quite a threatening piece of legislation. And this is all under consideration in the other states, South, South Australia, Western Australia, and of course, Tasmania. The Tasmanian Law Reform Institute um, produced what was a very controversial issues paper uh, at the beginning of last year and have uh, been silent since. There was a quite an adverse reaction to it. But we've seen this, these laws passed in New Zealand. We've just a few weeks ago, we've seen them passed in Canada. If you think Victoria is extreme, you should look at Canada um, and many US states. And the whole time the claim is that we need to have these laws 
uh, to prevent the harm of conversion therapy. But all the justifications that you hear rely on discredited therapies to alter same-sex attraction. You almost never hear serious examples being given about discredited therapies to do with gender identity. And what's going on here, it seems that they are using the um, discredited, outdated, long since disappeared therapies to do with same-sex attraction to form a platform for saying we should outlaw certain therapies in regard to gender identity. And this is a real concern. So what is confession therapy? I'm sorry you don't have my, have my slides so they can be made available um, by the organizers. But it's a practice that attempts to change or suppress a person's sexual orientation or gender identity, whether or not by request or consent. And that's a really important um, thing to emphasize that, um, oh, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you see me now? Can you, can you see me now, people, people, folks? Hello? Yes. Okay, we might be winning. Okay, I'm going to share screen. Can you, can you see the screen now? Uh huh. Bronwyn, how are, how are we doing? Can you see can you see the see the screen now? Yeah. Okay. I'll keep I'll keep going. I'm going to assume that you can see the screen. Um. So, the legislation refers to conversion therapy as a practice that attempts to change or suppress a person's sexual orientation or gender identity whether or not by request or consent. You have a 50 year old man, 50 year old woman who seeks help and yet it could be unlawful to respond to that request. That's so in all of the Australian laws and elsewhere. But only Queensland actually gives any examples. Queensland gives the examples of inducing nausea, vomiting or paralysis while showing the person's same sex images. These are shocking uh, treatments which are uh, has, as far as I know, long since died out. I haven't heard anybody claiming that in recent years, health professionals have been using such treatments or indeed other people, using shame or coercion to give the person an aversion to same-sex attractions. And then you see the words, or to encourage gender-conforming behavior. Well, can we not be male or female in all sorts of different ways? That's one of the issues about the vague language of encouraging gender conforming behavior. And then using other techniques on the person, encouraging the person to believe that being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or intersex is a defect or disorder. I've never heard anybody claiming that um, being intersex is a defect or disorder. It's a natural variation in the human form. But these are the sorts of things. Most of the other jurisdictions don't even attempt to give examples. But to the extent that Queensland does, you can see it's based upon therapeutic practices, which largely usually disappeared in the 1980s to try to cure same-sex attraction. Well, what we have now is a problem of definition inflation. This is a very common technique in social justice advocacy, that you take a word that uh, something of which everybody disapproves. We approve of domestic violence. All of us do, I hope all of us should. But then the meaning of that becomes ever more expanded. The word violence um, generally has been used in all sorts of contexts which go way beyond the um, imposition of physical force, um, force by way of an assault. So you take a word, you take its disapproval, you take its emotional um, effect, and this picks up Holly's uh, talk as well. And then you say all these other things are included in this as well. So the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute engages in massive definition inflation in its issues, issues paper. The Queensland law focused on therapeutic techniques. It focused upon act, actions by health professionals. 
But the working definition of the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute is that conversion therapy includes acts or statements, or statements that are aimed at changing, suppressing, or eradicating the sexual orientation or gender identity of another person. Notice that word statements, because when you then read on as to what they mean by that, they seek to include all sorts of activities which are not therapy, which are not um, practices similar to the aversion therapy of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and which had died out by the mid 1980s. They also say it includes the making of false and misleading claims about the physical or medical causes of sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, this is quite alarming because if we take sexual orientation, and I know uh, this is a very um, diverse audience in Hobart, but look at the science on sexual orientation. And there's quite a lot of different disagreement between experts as to why a same sex orientation develops in a person. There are genetic and hormonal explanations, there are environmental and other explanations. When we come to gender identity, there's a huge controversy about the etiology, the, 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 the origins of, a, of gender incongruence, to use a, a neutral term. And Diana spoke about these to, to some extent. There is a belief that you can be born in the wrong body, but actually the scientific evidence for that is not very strong. There is some, there is some, there are some indications from twin studies and this kind of thing that there could be a genetic factor, a hormonal factor in terms of influences in the womb and so on. But it's far from scientifically is established. Most experts would agree that if there is a biological component, then it's taken with a lot of other factors, environmental and social, that impact upon somebody to um, cause gender incongruence. So we have a scientific and medical debate about these things. But the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute wants to ban false or misleading claims about the physical and medical causes of sexual orientation of gender identity, as if the science were settled. You see how dangerous, if I may say so, this, this is. The idea that quite unscientific beliefs will be backed up by the criminal law. When we come to gender identity, there are powerful reasons to, to think that trauma could be a factor a um, very large percentage of all those who go to gender clinics seeking help um, are on the autism spectrum, which suggests there's a neurobiological aspect to all of this. Um, there's also been recent research from Westby Children's Hospital in Sydney showing that um, a child abuse, family dysfunction, um, disordered attachments, the psychologists talk about, these are also highly represented in the con in the cohort of people seeking help for gender dysphoria. So you cannot rule out at all psychological explanations and the, the impact of trauma, uh, adverse childhood events uh, in understanding the phenomenon of uh, gender incongruence. And yet we have the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute expanding the definition to statements, which in the views of whoever wrote that document, represent false and misleading claims about this science. It's also a deeply anti-religious document. I speak as a Christian myself. I was quite offended by the um, depth of hostility that I could read in the document uh, towards people of faith, notwithstanding that there were passages which talked about religious just freedom. One of the things which counted as possible conversion therapy is encouraging people to go to prayer groups or Bible studies or viewing and listening to sermons that take a particular view of sexual orientation or gender identity. These could be conversion therapy, according to at least the text of that issues paper. So you see how widely this, this goes, whatever you may, uh, may believe about these things. And then there's confusion at the very heart of the whole transgender movement. Is gender identity something innate or is it fluid? Um, the assumption behind these laws is that gender identity is immutable and cannot be changed. And therefore, any therapy aiming to change it must be uh, banned by criminal law and people should be threatened with jail if they engage in that therapy. And yet, gender experts will tell you that gender is fluid. This is a quote from Hidalgo and colleagues, four gender clinic experts writing in the United States in 2013. Gender may be fluid, they say, 
and is not binary, both at a particular time and if and when it changes within an individual across time. Now, maybe they were talking about um, children who have a very comfortable sense of being a boy or a girl, and then in their adolescent years develop gender incongruence. But if gender is fluid, it can be fluid in more than one direction. It could be flu fluid back towards comforting your gender. So there's a fundamental confusion at the very heart of the whole movement about whether gender is innate, immutable, fixed, or fluid. There's also a debate at the heart of the movement as to whether gender is immutable, fixed, assigned at birth, or socially constructed. Bernadette Wren, one of the leading clinicians in the Tavistock in London, has written very thoughtfully about the disconnect between, between her view that gender is socially constructed and the claims of her young clients that they were born in the wrong body. And then we see the incoherence in Victoria and Tasmania's self-ID laws. Both laws say that you cannot apply to change your gender identity more than once every 12 months, but you can change it after 12 months. How can gender identity be immutable if you're allowed to change it as often as every year? And remember each change is a change to your birth certificate. It's engaging in a fiction that um, <clears throat> if I at the age of 24 declare myself to have been born female, that we change my birth certificate to reflect that belief. And then you change it again if that belief changes. So there's incoherence at the very heart of all of these things. Now, under these conversion therapy laws, not all therapy is banned. It's okay if it's a practice or conduct that in the health service provider's reasonable professional judgment is necessary to provide a health service, that's Victoria and the ACT. Um, in Queensland, in the provider's reasonable professional judgment is part of the clinically appropriate assessment, diagnosis or treatment of a person. But notice in Victoria and the ACT, the word necessary. And that may be a really real limiting factor in terms of what um, the profession and the courts uh, allow. Yes, you engaged in therapy, but was it necessary? That might be a question which people disagree. And it's okay to assist someone considering a gender transition. It's okay under these laws even to explore gender identity. But what about people who are detransitioning? Is that conversion therapy? If you're helping a young woman who's gone through cross-sex hormone treatment with a deepened voice, um, a double mastectomy having made irreversible changes to her body, and you're helping her therapeutically now to adjust to acknowledging that she is now and always was a woman. Is that conversion therapy? We don't know. And so the question is, what justifies these criminal penalties? In relation to gender identity, there is no credible evidence from any study I have seen of harm from any therapeutic practice. Diana Kenny talked about the um, well-established research that most children going to gender clinics in the past, mainly boys, um, resolve their gender confusion, their gender incongruence, by the time they go through puberty, by the time they've gone through puberty. 75% or, or so resolve their gender incongruence. There are some who don't, and they go on to um, become a, a adults in the main who are gay or lesbian. But there's no clear evidence in the literature of any harm from any of these treatments. One study has been comprehensively debunked by Robert D'Angelo and colleagues in, 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 in Australia. And in all the discussion about these conversion therapy laws, and you can see this in the Tasmanian re report, you can see it in all the other debates, nobody quite tells you what is the therapy they want to ban. We understand that aversion therapy, inducing nausea um, to try to help people move away from same-sex attraction, that's appalling. We understand that's a therapy which you might want to ban, but it's long since disappeared. Um, but what is the therapy they want to ban in terms of um, gender identity? Nobody can say. It's just conversion therapy is a dreadful thing, therefore we should ban it. And they're not quite sure what it is that they want to, to ban. 
And yet therapy is practiced by the world leading, by some of the world leading gender clinics. There's a paper by two clinicians from the Tavistock in London, where they worked with 12 young people who came with gender dysphoria, diagnosed gender dysphoria, who wanted um, treatment to change their, their bodies. And through counseling, they found a different way to reconcile their feelings with their biological sex. So are we going to ban the work of gender clinics in counseling? This is incoherent stuff, utterly incoherent. So in summary, laws are being passed threatening mental health professionals and others with jail for practicing conversion therapy, but nobody knows exactly what it is they want to ban. There's no science to support the idea that gender identity is immutable and cannot be changed. I agree, it may be for some people, um, men in particular who transitioned into a female identity often in midlife will report years and years of difficulty and confusion. One only has the greatest of sympathy and concern for them. Um, so for some people, yes, it does seem to be immutable. It does seem to be a permanent thing. But to say that is so of all gender identity is simply unscientific. There's a mountain of evidence to the contra contrary. And yet there's this urgency to pass these laws whipped up by activists. The problem is, is this, friends, it has a chilling effect. Many young people now seeking to transition medically have serious psychiatric comorbidities. That's a technical term for saying they have serious illnesses um, which sit alongside the gender dysphoria. And Dan and Katie talked about some on some on some of those. Large numbers are on the autism spectrum. Others have histories of trauma, as I've explained, and dissociative, uh, sorry, um, uh, attachment disorders. There's also um, other clinical psychiatric problems as well. And the serious risk is that if they present to a psychologist or psychiatrist with gender dysphoria, they will not get help because the laws um, are threatening that mental health professional with jail if he or she engages with the underlying issues in that young person's life, which may, may be causing their sense of gender incongruence. And there's already anecdotal evidence that I'm hearing around us, or, or, or Australia of psychologists and psychiatrists turning clients away because they're worried by these laws. It's just better not to engage. Why would you risk it? Why would you risk being struck off by your profession to help somebody? There's so many clients queuing up outside the door wanting help. Why would you risk it to help this troubled young person who might turn around in a year or two and accuse you of conversion therapy? And so my concern, and I say this with all seriousness, is that we could see if these, with these laws an increase in suicide of young people an increase in poor and mental health for a very vulnerable population. And if we care about these young people who are flocking to gender clinics, saying that they are trans, if we care about them deeply, we will not pass these conversion therapy laws. Thank you. thing to the press to a report of MSPS a little earlier that the um, suicidal ideation and other mental health problems don't go down after puberty blockers and hormone treatments they tend to go up doesn't solve the problem at all as we well know with our last speaker today we sort of come full circle uh, back to the issue of women and sport uh, our Final speaker, Catherine Deves, who is here with us, so no more technical problems, hopefully. Catherine Deves is a practicing lawyer in New South Wales, and she is a co-founder and spokesperson for Save Women's Sport Australasia, so you can see why she's here, huh? She's also mother of three sports-mad little girls, she tells us, so it's, it's something that she deals with directly on a daily basis. She was motivated to speak out in defense of women's sex-based rights in sport when she realized there was no coordinated campaign in Australia to speak up for little girls. 
teenagers and women whose rights to fair play and safety in sport were being impacted by so-called inclusion policies that replaced the category of sex with that of gender identity. And I'd just like to add a little footnote. Hannah Maltzi was interviewed in the press um, this week in the wake of the publicity around um, Senator Chandler's bill and um, saying that, oh, no, there aren't that many examples. There's just me and Leah Thomas. In fact, there is a documentation of well over a hundred, probably more examples of women who would have won competitions who have been ousted by a trans identified male who has claimed to be a woman and won the competition and women have worked all their lives to achieve excellence and suddenly they're just thrown on the rubbish heap and this is happening in a number of countries across the world so it's not a single lone phenomenon <coughs> so that's what Kat's going to talk to us Catherine's going to talk to us about women's sports inclusion of males means in fact getting back to what Holly was talking about the exclusion of women and girls All right, so the Sex Discrimination Act, Section 42, protects women's sport. It allows us to exclude males over the age of 12 from any competitive sporting activity on the basis of their sex if strength or stamina or physique are relevant. Parliament stated that the purpose of the section is to acknowledge biological differences between men and women. Sounds perfectly reasonable. But the insertion of gender identity into the act in 2013 by the Gillard government has led to the willful misinterpretation of section 42 by Australian sporting authorities. In 2019, the AHRC, Australian Human Rights Commission and Sport Australia introduced trans and gender diverse inclusion guidelines that place gender identity as the primary defining characteristic for sport. And this extends to accessing amenities and accommodation. A person registers to play, coach, umpire or manage a sport based on whatever their gender identity is. Sex is now no longer a consideration. Sports organisations are told that the likelihood of, finding, of a finding of unlawful discrimination will be minimised if they follow these trans and gender diverse inclusion guidelines and imply that failure to do so is unlawful. So if organizations wish to offer a single sex sporting category, they have to put a special measure in place or apply for an exemption. They are told to seek legal advice. Placing a litigious and administrative burden on everyone from the smallest rural community club through to multi-million dollar national leagues. But as we know, most sports in Australia are not played at the corporate level. It's the oval down the street, the pool around the corner, the club in the middle of the suburb, run by volunteer mums, dads, and community members, giving up precious time to sort the rosters, serve the sausage sandwiches, and cut up the oranges. These ordinary Australians do not have the time or the resources to get legal advice. They will simply follow the guidelines to avoid being exposed to expensive litigation or having to defend discrimination complaints. When guidelines warn them against excluding on the basis of sex, the volunteers will trust the advice from head office, advice that has been influenced and informed by pro-trans lobby groups such as ACON, the former AIDS Council of New South Wales, through their Pride in Sport initiative. For example, Hockey Australia states that registration platforms must be gender inclusive and align with ACON's recommended gender indicators. Why? What does that even mean? Who, who gives ACON, a heavily taxpayer subsidised AIDS prevention charity, authority to dictate sports policy and erase sex from the sport registration process? So we have nine peak sporting bodies, AFL, cricket, hockey, netball, rugby, tennis, touch, unisport and water polo, with 13 more pledging to do so, who have signed up to being members in ACON's Pride in Sports scheme to display sex with gender identity in sport. And these extend to schools, junior, senior, national and international events and competitions. 
So an organisation could rely on a competitive sport exemption in the Act to exclude someone, but the guidelines state inclusion, there's that word again, must be the main consideration. This is an example of Stonewall law. The law as they would like it to be, not as it is, because inclusion is not an element of the legislation. Principles of fair competition and player safety, again, they come up, that should be balanced with inclusion for proportionate and appropriate sporting policy are completely disregarded. So further, the guidelines explain that legislative inclusions do not apply to sport that is not competitive, yet competitive is not defined. So the guidelines promote an interpretation that social sports or sports for participation are not competitive. But again, this is where the vast majority of sport is played in Australia. Only a minuscule number actually make it to elite levels. So little girls, like my daughters, will come to realise that no matter how hard they try, how many sacrifices they make, how skilled they become, um, and for my daughters who have three training sessions a week and play two games on the weekend, I think they've earned the right to the thrill of competition and potential victory. But suddenly that doesn't matter because they're nine years old at a community club, they would not be considered competitive. And if a boy wanted to play in their girls' competition, there's nothing we can do about it. So elite does not magically manifest. Grassroots and community sport is where journey to A grade and professional sports begins. Yet the dropout rate from, for girls from organized sport accelerates as they get older, accelerating with the onset of, pubis, of puberty and the guidelines are willfully blind to the obvious that offering a single sex female competition is one antidote to this alarming attrition rate. And the guidelines fail to look at the athlete as an entire human being, that it is a person's whole self who plays sport, not just their strength or stamina or physique, as based on the skill set required for whatever the particular sport is. There is a failure to acknowledge that sports performance incorporates all three of those elements to varying degrees. The guidelines are pretending that organs, skeleton, muscles, ligaments, eyesight, hearing, reflexes, spatial ability, endocrinological system, size, and on and on do not work in concert. They are ignoring that when you compare like for like in males and females, the males will always outperform females with a minimum 10 to 12% performance advantage that is apparent and measurable from primary school. And although the mums and dads on the sideline of junior sport do not need to be convinced with peer reviewed evidence that boys outperform the girls from at least the age of eight. So why has Sport Australia not conducted a wide ranging, independent, transparent consultation, similar to the UK Sports Council and the prestigious Canadian McDonald Laureate in Institute, who both concluded that we cannot have inclusion of biological men in women's sports, and fair competition for women and girls. You can have one or the other, not both, but our authorities are pretending there isn't a conflict that, and they pretend that we can have both. And in doing so, fair competition and player safety is sacrificed for women and girls. So this is a problem. This is a problem for anyone who recognizes the simple need for a dedicated female sports category. We are hearing there is nothing to see here. There is not a problem. Yet Save Women's Sports USA have counted at least 76 biological men competing in women's elite sport. And these are not the ones playing at community level. The woman who contacted me saying that her teammate had her hand broken by a male on the opposite team taking the penalty shot. The novice coach distressed at new policies that expose her young female charges to male bodies in the change room. The woman disparaged and defamed on social media because she queried uh, the material increased risk of injury due to the males now participating in her high impact collision sport. The coach seeing her team hold back on their performance because they did not want to be selected for A grade because they did not want to go up against the men on the opposition team. The teenager horrified 
that a 12 year old boy was being allowed to run against the younger girls and win and all the adults were too afraid to say anything. And the numerous parents and grandparents that we hear from concerned about what this will potentially mean for their daughters and granddaughters sporting opportunities. There is a club in my neighborhood that rejected a girl from a boys team that she had played on for years because she had turned 12 and because of her female sex. Yet the same club refused to confirm with another mother that her teenage daughter's girls competition was for females only because there just might be a boy who declared a female gen gender identity who might just want to play. So that club is prepared to exclude girls on the basis of their sex, but will not do the same for the boys. And they have relied on the same law to ensure a boy will be included on the basis of a female gender identity. Girls are losing out every time. What a mess. So we are told that women accept this status quo, that they welcome these biological men, but women are conditioned to be kind, to be inclusive, to, make, to not make a fuss, even to their own detriment, be, because women know they will face even worse sanctions if they resist. Expulsion, loss of opportunity, rescinded scholarships, canceled sponsorships. They will be excluded, which is ironic because the main criticism of the Save Women's Sports Bill introduced by Senator Claire Chandler is that it is exclusionary. It is not. It will simply rectify the conflict of rights that was created when gender identity was inserted into the act and the legal definitions of man and woman were removed. This was a fundamental change to a definition that was never contentious. It was done without broad community consultation, yet has significant and far reaching consequences for women. Women are being faced with the very dangerous proposition of the erasure of the category of female sex, which removes all our legal rights as women outlined in CEDAW and the SDA. Authorities providing guidance that gender identity is the paramount protected characteristic leaves us with no way to exclude biological men from space where it matters, such as prisons, shelters, healthcare provision, lesbian spaces, and sport. That such a fundamental change to our statutory human rights and legal understanding of our basic biological humanity, one would think the Gillard government would have made provision to assess the efficacy and impact of these, these changes, but they didn't. So it is left to unresourced grassroots groups and informal networks of volunteer women to raise awareness. Yet here we are. In less than 18 months since we started with this campaign, there is a bill tabled in federal parliament to clarify and preserve our rights. And we did this with nothing more than determination, grit, and a bit of courage. And of course, the indomitable Senator Chandler. So this week, the light has been shone on her bill with the media finally standing up and taking notice when Prime Minister Morrison stated, stated his support. Cue the baying mobs. The high profile men telling us there is nothing to see here. The pro-trans groups falsely claiming they are being banned from playing any sport at all. The members of the public who can't see a problem because the mainstream Australian media has failed to cover this issue with any impartiality or at all. Former elite Australian athletes and parliamentarians staying silent or publicly demonstrating allegiance to gender identity by suddenly including pronouns in their Instagram. And males who claim to be trans interviewed as experts on their muddied arguments about science and asserting their lived experience is equivalent to hard data. So Senator Chandler was criticized for declining to name the organizations and people who approached her. I do not accept those critics fail to understand on why she would insist on protecting their anonymity. The Senator, Nicole Flint, myself, many others, um, have received a variety of vile and vicious abuse for speaking up for women. Women across the political spectrum, who in the eyes of the so-called liberal media and the progressive left, are taking an allegedly unpopular stance, even though polling clearly demonstrates 
that the overwhelming majority of Australians support our position. We represent the silent majority. We represent the majority that refuses to compromise on protecting the rights of women and girls. So what's missing from this debate is the voices of the little girls, their parents, young women, grown women, those who have suffered damage and harm and exclusion, who are concerned about the policies who will cause damage and harm and exclusion to female athletes when they're forced to compete against males. I'll tell you why. Looking to other jurisdictions, we have Ivy Leaguer, uh, Ivy Leaguer Leah Thomas from Pennsylvania, 22 year old male, ranked less than 450 competing in the men's swimming, but now competing in the women's and smashing pool, meet and college records. When the females raised concerns, they were referred to mental health services. Thomas uses the women's changing and sharing facilities. And when the girls told college authorities they were uncomfortable with an intact heterosexual male being in a space where they are undressed, their concerns were not only ignored, they were told to stop complaining and be quiet. Afraid of retaliation, risking scholarships, reputation and future career opportunities, they can only speak anonymously. Women are being told they are crazy, that they do not have the right to have boundaries when they are vulnerable, that they are in the wrong when they feel uncomfortable. So not only are these women losing out on athletic opportunities, they are being stripped of the ability to advocate for themselves. This is the most insidious part of the recent appropriation of women's spaces, resources and rights. That we are being told that we are in the wrong when we stand up for ourselves, when we acknowledge the reality of biological sex, wrong side of history, we're selfish, we're exclusionary, we're bigots, that there is no problem to see here, move along, sit down, be quiet. Where have we heard this before? The campaign to allow biological men into women's sport is nothing more than a front for the destruction of our rights, our right to safety, our right to privacy, our right to dignity, our right to participate free from discrimination in public life. Sport is inherently discriminatory. We have categories to accommodate differences in age, weight, disability, and everyone understands that is for the positive purpose of player safety and fair competition. So why aren't girls entitled to that? Why should a sporting organization that offers a single sex category be at risk for litigation? Why shouldn't we have a bill that brings the law in line with community expectations? Because if we do not, we are faced with the prospect of subjecting female Australian athletes to our own Leah Thomas. No young girl should have to sacrifice her dreams of victory because Australian legislators failed to act when they had the chance. After a century of advocating for our rights, even one girl losing out is one girl too many. And I would like to ask, where are all the Australian elite sportswomen and retired athletes? Many of whom have enjoyed a professional... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Many of whom have enjoyed recognition and professional success due to their own sporting achievements. Why are they betraying the young girls who come after them by not standing up and preserving the same opportunities they had for our future generations of sportswomen? I might as well tell my daughters now to set aside their dream of being Matildas at the 2032 Brisbane Olympics. Because what is the end game here? If things continue the way that they are, women's sport will simply be a consolation category for mediocre and aged out male athletes. When there, when there is a society-wide live discussion around consent and boundaries for women, why in the context of sport are women not permitted to say no? Because we say no to biological men in our sport. We say no to biological men in our amenities. We say no to biological men on the track, the field, the podium. Why can't we say no? So we can stop the prospect of misguided Australian authorities enabling men and boys to push our daughters aside and trample on their sporting dreams. Here in Australia today, the Save Women's Sports Bill 
is a simple piece of legislation, of a simple piece of legislative reform that will prevent this from happening. So save women's sport. Kath described what, were, what women were being told at UPenn and the word gaslighting kept coming to the front of my mind. We're suffering gaslighting about this. We're being told we're mad, we need mental health treatment, we're being exclusionary and so on. How often have women feminists resisted that process of gaslighting? We are now at the end of this forum and we have finished on a very strong note on Save Women's Sports Australia. Practically, how do we do that? We have to get people in Australia to understand what's going on because most people don't know what's going on. They're getting the propaganda. They're getting the one-sided media reporting. Politicians need to know what's going on. We know that the Greens are pretty much captured by trans ideology. The ALP sort of, I know Anthony Albanese personally, I'm in his electorate, I'm trying to talk to him about it. But if we do not start lobbying the political class and hard, and we do not stop, start lobbying the independents and those on the left hard, this bill is not going to get up. So we really need, we really need this to be a bipartisan bill, multi-partisan, and we need people to understand because they are being fed lies, they're being fed lies by protesters outside events like this, they're being fed lies by the media. We are in a really in an Orwellian period of disinformation. So if we don't talk about what's going on around us, if you don't tell your friends, if you don't tell everybody damn damn person you know that this is going on, then it's just going to get worse. And I do have faith that one day the good citizens of Australia will wake up and put a stop to this, but they need our help. I have a number of thank yous before we leave each other today because these events don't just sort of fall out of the heavens. The, a lot of people um, work together to make them happen. And firstly, of course, we have our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful speakers. I have so enjoyed being part of it. And thank you to all six of you. And we do owe a special vote of Bex. Thanks, I do repeat it to Alderman Jeff Briscoe for publicly and in city council meetings supporting women's rights and freedom of speech and resisting the no platforming of organisations like Women's Speak Tasmania. The staff at Hobart City Council have been terrific. They've been very helpful in putting on this event and that's been great. So we do thank them for their kindness and support. We have other people working behind the scenes. We have Lynn Robinson, who actually picked me up from the airport yesterday. So doing all sorts of things. And to Tanya as well. And both Lynn and Tanya have, uh, have had a long-term commitment to making this forum happen. We have, I must thank Doug and Jenny for ensuring security arrangements uh, met Hobart City Council requirements. And Doug's been really very proactive about that. So great thanks to both Doug and Jenny. Down here, we have Natalie with her mega camera, Natalie J. Russell, who has been taking our photographs. <laughs> In front of me, our long-suffering sound person, Paul, who has helped us resolve the technical issues. And I must also express a vote of thanks to all the anonymous donors that made this forum a possibility. We function on a shoestring budget and each cent donated is a precious help, including to help people get here in the first place to actually speak at it. Uh, so it's, it's really, we really, really appreciate those people who gave money. And most especially, uh, I'd like to thank the, the people of the Coalition for the Biological, Biological Reality, not all of whom I can name today, but many provided to me personally and others resources and information and links to articles and all sorts of things to help us um, 
keep up to date with what's going on, and most particularly to D, and this, we do have people who don't want to be named because of the sorts of intimidation people are suffering. So we have D, we have Ida McGregor, and we have Stasia Fry, who's founded the coalition, and they have been tireless in organizing this event, advertising, liaising with speakers, volunteers, and the media. So really, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for coming, participating, staying. I know with the Zoom and everything, it can be really tiring to listen to so many speakers, particularly when you've got a little screen. So you really hung in there and, and it's so important that you did. So please just go out and help us stop this madness. Thank you. Thank you.